Hello there, fellow Dragonborn, Kato Genesis here. And if none of you are wondering what is Skyrim, and more importantly, why is Skyrim? Well, I will answer with, I did a tips and tricks over seven years ago, and it's time to do a new one for Anniversary Edition. This version slash update of the game added all of the Creation Club content and a bunch of new stuff into one chunky DLC. With all this new content added, of course, there was also new things to discover. So I'll be adding some updated versions of older tips that I gave in the 2014 Tips and Tricks video and some new ones for Anniversary Edition. I won't be including much in the terms of leveling skills because that would retread things I already did in the ultimate Skyrim leveling guide linked here and in the description that still works just fine for Anniversary Edition and is glitch free. So here are this many tips and tricks I wish I knew when I first began playing Skyrim Anniversary Edition. I'll start with the one that had the best reaction. You can shout gatherable critters out of the air. One little foos will cause butterflies and the like to fall in their reagent form. And if you've unfortunately picked up a disease and spot a hawk way up in the sky, you can use a bow to shoot them down, but it is easier using the kind's peace shout, which just kills birds for some reason. But you get hawk feathers out of the deal, which remove diseases when consumed raw and are lighter than a remove disease potion. Skyrim Anniversary Edition added a absolute ton of rare items and artifacts and such from previous Elder Scrolls entries. In fact, this might be an overwhelming amount for some. However, if you feel particularly nostalgic for Morrowind or Oblivion, Anniversary does give you that pair of nostalgia goggles for a couple hours at least. Ghosts of the Tribunal is the chunky Morrowind-related quest, but naturally requires you to go to the Solstheim region, which is part of the Dragonborn DLC, heading into the Temple of of Ravenrock and finding a dossier in one of the rooms. After doing that, you'll be on a good few hours of a Morrowind adventure. Those of you who miss delving into alien ruins and the Gates of Oblivion have the sizable quest known as The Cause, which sees the Mythic Dawn reappearing in Skyrim and a new threat that you've got to take care of. Unfortunately, this is locked at level 46 or higher, so you will have to get to level 46, but once you do, a courier will approach you and hand you a message to trigger the quest. Fishing, which special edition users got for free too, provides a whole bunch of rare and unique items and a fun climax to the fishing story. There's also the Bitter Cup quest you can find the starter for in the Falkreath Tavern, leading to the ruins to the north, which is a true three-pronged choice-based quest with stories and rewards that differ based on your choice. I found each of these interesting in their own ways, and that's not even close to all the things in Anniversary Edition, just a few highlights that I think you should check out. If you have the interest of a fist fighting style build, it's never been easier than with Anniversary Edition. It used to be that you'd have to go to the Ratway to find the Gloves of the Pugilist, Light Armor, which would not utilize the Fists of Steel perk, for a guaranteed way to get the Fortify Unarmed Enchantment. But now with Fearsome Fists, not only do you get choices of multiple variants of mean looking gauntlets to find and craft, but blacksmiths will now carry various Fearsome Fists that sometimes already have the Unarmed Enchantment. There's some situations in Skyrim where you'll want to free up your offhand. Things like spells tend to make this difficult because tapping the same hotkey for that spell puts it in your right hand too, which is good for dual casting but bad for everything else. Also, if you're playing a character that uses unarmed attacks, you'll need both hands free if you want to pull off some suplexes and choke slams. And ideally, I imagine, we would all like to do this without having to shuffle through favorites or item menus. So to do this, you'll need to hotkey either a torch or a shield, and by quickly double tapping, that's equipping and unequipping it, you will free up your left hand. If you would like to live the life of an average adventurer, not some sort of demigod with dragon powers, you can simply choose not to do the main quest, Dragon Rising, where you meet Irileth at the tower outside of Whiterun. That's the quest that triggers dragons appearing in Skyrim. If you don't do that quest, there will be no dragons except for a select scripted few. However, as mentioned already, the disadvantage of not spawning dragons into the world is you also don't get access to shouts. And the Dragonborn DLC also requires you to uh, be the Dragonborn and finish up the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller to activate. But this is pretty helpful if you just want to postpone meeting dragons in full combat until you're ready. Just another role-playing option.
Alternative armors were added to Skyrim Anniversary Edition. There are 15 different ones under the Alternative Armors name based on the sets from the Elder Scrolls Blades, including alternatives to Dwarven, Daedric, Orcish, Dragon, Stalrim, and more. There's also brand new one, Silver, which looks awesome. And I created a guide on all of them, gonna plug that right now. But I would like to mention that each of the quests related to these armors are not the only instance on where you'll find these sets. Outside of all these being craftable, if you meet the right criteria, these were also added to enemy loot pools and enemy equipment, meaning you may find bandit chiefs that are wearing full sets of insulated dragon plate armor. Well before you've maybe even seen dragons, or at least before you're able to craft it yourself. So some bandits may be a bit more stylish than you remember, and the level of finding this loot is a bit all over the place. When it comes to consumables, soups are among the most powerful you can craft. Specifically, I'm talking about vegetable soup and venison stew. These both regenerate health and stamina over time for 720 seconds. A great benefit to this is that while your stamina is constantly regenerating, you can also constantly do power attacks and shield bashes. Also mildly beneficial if you're playing as a vampire who no longer regenerates stamina during the day. To cook up these soups, you'll need to find a cooking station of course but in Skyrim it's not particularly hard to find a kitchen and a cooking station nearby. As for the ingredients though cabbage potatoes and leeks are grown at any of the farms and gardens nearby any towns and cities and the owners of said farms won't care if you take it for your own because they'll be under the assumption that you're picking the produce for them for a little bit of gold which you can do too. As for the other ingredients like tomatoes venison and salt piles these can be be found in places like hunting lodges, barrels, and food sacks. If you use any amount of melee in your build and or playing survival character who needs something easy to make, having a stack of these soups will help you out greatly. While numerous player homes were added with Anniversary Edition, one in particular proved to be an absolute gold mine as well as a good source to grow produce for the aforementioned powerful soups, and that would be the Golden Hill Plantation. This is a farm plot southeast of Rorikstead, and showing up at the plantation will trigger a short quest that has the end result of you becoming the owner of this plantation. Unlike the other player homes introduced in Anniversary Edition though, the plantation has some hearth fire systems integrated too, tasking you with building upgrades yourself as well as hiring a steward. And as a heads up, some of the companions once you become Harbinger are available to be a steward. Anyway, all of the farm-based up upgrades, as well as the plants you put in the garden plots, all add to the plantation's daily gold generation. If you have the apiary, livestock, windmill, bunkhouse, farmhands, and crops, blisterwort is the most profitable, you'll be gaining upwards of a thousand gold daily, with seemingly no cap to how much income your steward can actually hold. Crops the farmhands gather daily will also end up in the pantry. If you're going the potion making route, you can plant the herbs in mass that you're going to need for said potions. Just a versatile, money making player home. With mention of ways to free up your offhand as well as generate stamina with soups, you can become the ultimate mining machine. Previously, I thought attacking mineral veins was the fastest way to mine them, but block bashing actually turns out to be a little bit faster. Dual wielding pickaxes is fairly fast as well, but you'll need to carry around two pickaxes to do that. Some veterans of Skyrim may tell you that this permanently glitches out ore veins, but rest easy, this is not a permanent glitch, and if an ore vein you've mined previously has its veins showing again but can't be interacted with, that is to say, no interact button showing up on screen, simply exit the mine that you're in and walk back inside, and that mineral vein should be interactable again. Simple and straightforward. This is primarily for mouse and keyboard users. You can use items while they're still in containers by holding down shift and clicking on them. On controller, it actually shows you what buttons to press in the lower left hand corner, but on mouse and keyboard, you do have to hold down shift for it to actually tell you how to do it. So this is especially useful in things like survival mode because you can eat produce and food items right out of the container. And this works for notes and books too. If you find a note on a dead body, for example, you can read it while it's on the dead body and then pocket it so you don't have to sift through your inventory just to find it again so you can activate whatever the next thing is if it's a quest based note and anniversary edition sure has a lot of them notes Enchanting is pretty resource intensive, especially if you're going for maxing it out. You need to disenchant items you find in dungeons, get lots of soul gems, as well as capture souls into the soul gems to use on 
your equipment. You can get soul gems and the soul trap spell from court wizards and magic merchants, but also if you've taken part in the main story and made it to Blackreach, this is the only place where you'll find geode veins that you can just mine to get more soul gems. If you're not really into mining or don't like Blackreach, just go into any Dwemer ruin and the Dwemer automatons there will drop many filled and empty soul gems for you to use. There are ways to make soul trapping easier too than just casting the soul trap spell, which I recently found out actually has range to it and is not just on touch blew my mind, but if you've already invested into Conjuration, you can work up to the Soul Stealer perk, which lets you have any of your bound weapons cast Soul Trap on an enemy kill. If you want to automate your Soul Trapping further, you can equip a follower with an enchanted Soul Trap weapon. Mace of Molag Ball is excellent for this. Give them all your empty Soul Gems and have them just Soul Trap for you. If that companion accidentally starts trapping the smaller souls into the more valuable Grand and Great Soul Gems and you didn't want them to, you can simply take those larger soul gems from your companion and drop them on the ground to empty them, allowing you to try again for larger souls. In Anniversary Edition and the Creation Club content, there were no new dialogue voice lines recorded, so a lot of the time, notes or notes given to you by NPCs telling you to look at said note will be how you start quests for the Creation Club stuff. I have noticed a pattern after doing so many of these, and finding notes for these quests are primarily in three types of places. First, inns and taverns. There could be a new note for you on the front counter, or tables and nightstands in the back rooms. It's also possible the innkeepers themselves could trigger new dialogue after asking for rumors and bounties. Was that too? I'm gonna consider that too. Third would be the barracks of city guards. Previously a location players had no reason to go to. Now there is the opportunity of many of these guards barracks to include a guards dossier related to a specific character that triggers a quest when activated. Keep an eye out for those notes. They will lead you to some pretty sweet loot. If you're looking at a shelf of books and wondering which one can raise your skills, check the gold value. If it's above 20, it might be a skill book. If you know it's a skill book and don't want to use it just yet, you can simply tell your follower to pick up the book by holding the activate button while looking at your follower and then selecting the book. The reason for waiting and having companions pick up these skill books instead is the same reason as other games that have skill books, well, most, and that's that they give a flat level for that skill no matter what. So using the skill book around 90 skill rather than around say 20 skill will be way more beneficial because that's less work you have to put into leveling that skill yourself. Looting is a major aspect and so is carry capacity. Sometimes you'll go over that capacity and wonder, what the heck do I do? I'm over encumbered, maybe I'll just eat all these wheels of cheese. Well, that's one way to mitigate your carry weight. Using your companions as a mule, of course, are an option for this. But what if you're a lone wolf and or your companion is already loaded down with stuff? But if you also have a horse nearby, which, side note, Anniversary Edition comes with wild horses too, and you can get a map to find them from horse merchants, you can both ride the horse at normal speed while encumbered. Horses don't care if you're encumbered, and also fast travel with said horse if you're not playing in survival mode. But everyone also likes a bit more carry weight, and backpacks provide 75, with a couple of optional attribute or skill boosts depending on the backpack you want to use. The requirements are surprisingly minimal if you want to craft them yourself and under the miscellaneous category at the forge, but backpacks have also been added to the loot pools of dressers. Yes, dressers are finally useful as lootable objects, so the next time you kill old lady Anise for her cabin, check the dresser drawers. There might be some backpacks in there for you. Spellcasters, early on, you'll want to hang on to as much magicka as you possibly can for casting spells, especially during combat. Keep in mind that while you're holding or channeling a spell, you won't regenerate magicka. The first recommendation I would have for spell efficiency would be canceling spells. And there are a few ways to do this. First is pressing your sheath button, which puts your hands down and cancels whatever spell you're holding. But that takes extra valuable time in the heat of combat, not ideal. Another way, if you're charging up a spell, you can tap the attack button quickly to cancel that spell's release, refunding that valuable magic juice to destroy an enemy with later. And finally, this relates to the early channeling spells, healing and flames in particular. While these types of spells are 
are being channeled, you're not regenerating Magicka. So what I would advise as soon as possible, if you are going the mage route, is to invest in a bolt spells if it's offensive magic, and at the very least, fast healing for restoration magic, because that is a flat amount of Magicka that you're using, instead of constantly burning Magicka per second in a tense combat encounter. If you run out, Magicka can be recovered, of course, with Magicka potions, as well as level ups. This goes for all of your attributes. Anniversary Edition provides a brand new series of spells that blows all the other destruction spells out of the water. And that would be the elemental spells. Elemental Flare, Bolt, Burst, and Blast for Novice, Apprentice, Adept, and Expert, respectively. The Novice version of this, Elemental Flare, deals 15 points of fire damage and 15 points of shock damage with additional magic and stamina damage. Elemental Flare does nearly everything. Even though there isn't frost damage per se on this spell, it's affected by all of the spell-altering perks in the Destruction Tree. That's Augmented Flames, Frost, and Shock to increase its damage, as well as the following perks, Deep Freeze, Intense Flames, and Disintegrate. You can probably forget about Disintegrate though, since Disintegrate is a spectacle thing and there's a lot of bugs around the Disintegration Ash Piles anyway, but the Fear and Paralysis effects? really great. The only real downside to the elemental spells is their area of effect can hit followers too. So it might be best to hire a follower that uses bows and or is also a spellcaster so they don't get caught in the blast zone. While Expert is about as high as I go with the game's difficulty, I would imagine that Legendary difficulty in Skyrim sees destruction become much more viable thanks to these spells. And if you have been playing Legendary and have been using these elemental spells, I and others would love to know, I'm sure, how they fare. In Skyrim Anniversary Edition, you don't have to play Dawnguard to have access to sweet crossbows. Not just that, but the Dwarven Enhanced Crossbow, which ignores half of your enemy's armor, now has competition and even other crossbows in the ring to surpass it in damage. Because you can make enhanced variants of the new crossbows added to the game as well. And these are variants made of materials that we are all familiar with all the way up to Daedric, Dragon, and Stalrim. Of these two pieces of content, the first is called Expanded Crossbows, and it couldn't be easier to access, because these are found at the Fletcher in the City of Solitude. Speak to Fihata and he will sell you some of these crossbows, or if you look around a bit, you will also see them on display that you can just take when he's not looking. Thanks to lockpicking not having skill requirements for expert locks, you could walk away with a Daedric crossbow as early as you want and enhance it later when you have the blacksmithing skill to do so. Prior to expanded crossbows was elite crossbows, coming along with a little quest of its own and rewarding with elven and ebony crossbows. The quest Night Hunter will start when you go to Ironback Hideout. This is northwest in the mountains a ways from Solitude and read Kagrash's letter on the table in the ruined building. Complete the short objective and you'll return to Ironback Hideout, now with a way to get into the cellar to access these two crossbows on display as well as some ammunition. And these are also upgradable to enhanced versions. So if you have played as an archer and want to vary it up a little bit while still maintaining your stealth archer build, there's plenty of crossbows to use now with that lovely bonus of low fall off and armor penetration. Skyrim Anniversary Edition added even more melee weapons to place in your personal armory and probably not use. Well, of course, this isn't a guide to those melee weapons and instead just general tips. Advice on using them effectively still applies. We already talked about infinite power attacks when it comes to using soups, so you can already factor that in. But each category of weapon has its own benefits and trade-offs. So we'll start with daggers and throw dual wielding in there too. Daggers are utterly devastating in Skyrim so long as you're unseen. As a weapon class, this is made even easier because daggers are completely completely silent, whereas all other weapon classes create noise. There's a tiny caveat to this. For reliable results, especially if you're dual wielding, main handing a dagger will guarantee that you're not creating noise when you swing it on an unsuspecting foe. Daggers have an exceptional use for dual wielders as well. Even if you're not investing in dual flurry, having a dagger in your offhand will dramatically increase the speed of the dual wielding attacks you do with both hands. That's tapping both attack buttons or holding them down for the dramatic multi-shot power attack. So for example, if you have a dagger in your offhand and the slowest class of one-handed weapon, the mace in your right hand, it's going to swing insanely fast if you're swinging with both hands at the same time. Thanks to the nature of blunt weapons too, you'll have a higher rate of stunning your foe 
as well. Speaking of daggers and dual wielding, if one of your hands has a dagger and you've invested in dual flurry or have the elemental fury shout, power attacking with a single dagger will hit twice, a standard attack and a power attack due to how insanely fast your attack speed will be. But now let's move on to the main hand, and any one-hander can apply here. Shuffling between standard attacks and power attacks will ultimately cause you to hit more often. Tapping your standard right-handed attack, then holding it down mid-swing, will interrupt it with a power attack, causing you to hit twice a lot faster, kind of like the offhand dagger trick, but with something bigger than a dagger. Even better, the following two strikes after a standard power attack are faster. But if you're also not really one for keeping track or timing, just vary it up a little between standard attacks and power attacks, and you will cause more damage per second with a one-hander just by doing so. Unfortunately, this doesn't apply to two-handers, which we'll move on to now. Two-handers sacrifice the use of your offhand with more damage, and thanks to perks, have the explicit benefit of being the only melee class that includes perks allowing you to do sweeping splash attacks. And while I didn't mention this until now, holding a direction will change the type of power attack you do. Right and left are horizontal slices, backwards is a retreating power attack, and forwards of course is a charging power attack. The forward charging power attack is relatively easy to aim because you're just going forward. However, I found especially with two-handers that the power attacks left, right, and back are kind of a pain to control sometimes. So what I recommend when you're using a two-hander in battle and facing off with mostly melee enemies is to toggle your run button especially for those sideways power attacks. This should help keep you from jogging out of range when you're trying to do your sideways and backwards power attacks. I'm not a melee master by any means, and I'm sure there's things that I missed here, so please put in the comments if there's any melee things and tricks that you know. As I just mentioned, please put your own tips and tricks in the comments below to help out your fellow players. And if you're not tired of me just yet, you can check out the Skyrim Ultimate Leveling Guide if you're working on leveling your character, and some of my anniversary guides for all the fishing uniques as well as the alternative armors. If you found this useful, entertaining, or both, please do whatever it is you see fit to show that. And among the things you can do is by supporting on Patreon, like my amazing patrons on screen now, including Wasteland Legends, Sven, and David Hoover. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and may you wander Tamriel like you own it.